People often ask about how to fit the practice into their lives, and it's a valid question. You want to find ways to bring the peace and calm of a centered mind into your work, into your family life. But the problem with that sometimes is that all of a sudden the peace and calm are made to serve the purposes of your work and your family life. And the context gets very small and confining. Try to keep the mind still so that you can get the job done better, or that you can survive the ravages of modern corporate world, modern school world. the ravages of modern family life. The meditation just becomes one more technique to serve those ends. It's good to think about the issue the other way around. How do you take the practice as your context, and how do you fit your life into that? Because you want to remember that your life is not defined by your work or your family or even your culture. It can be, and people oftentimes make us want to think that that's how we have to fashion our lives. The statement that you come from a particular culture means that you have to think in certain ways, or that we're living now in a postmodern world, so we have to accept postmodern values, with the digital world and with digital values. But the Dharma reminds you that you have a choice. You can step out of those worlds. After all, each of those is one form of becoming, and every form of becoming involves suffering. And if you want to be defined by your culture, that means you want to be defined by your suffering. You can ask yourself, do you really want that? How about creating a larger context? Remember the values. The values here are often very simple, and they're defined in ways that we tend to overlook. You may have heard that, and it's true, that monks chant the body mocha once every two weeks. They meet together and one of the monks chants the body mocha. And it's all about very technical, minor rules. Some of the rules are major, of course. No killing, no stealing, no sex, no lying about your attainments. Those are the big rules. But then there are a lot of little rules, even down to how you eat your food, how you behave in public, don't swing your arms, that kind of thing. You may wonder why this concern for the little details, and it's because the rules by which we live are the things that indicate our values. We try to reaffirm our values every two weeks. Our values create our culture. Buddhism has always been counterculture. Even in India, it was countercultural. And when you have a countercultural practice like this, you need to band together and remind one, one another of what your values are. This is one of the reasons why, when the lay people come on Sundays, we, we chant the precepts to remind us of these are our values. This is what holds us together. And these are values that we hold in opposition to the world. The world prizes in some ways that are hard to understand. They say we need to kill, we need to steal, we need to lie. Illicit sex is okay in certain circumstances. Drinking is fine in certain circumstances. That's what defines a lot of our culture. And we take the precepts and say, no, we're going to stand apart. This is standing apart not only here in America in the 21st century, but it was standing apart back in India. The time of the Buddha standing apart in Thailand. To practice the Dharma is to step outside of your culture, and it's an act of freedom. But you have to reaffirm those values every day. This was why it might be a good at the end of a morning meditation session to remind yourself of the five precepts. This is also why we have the contemplation of the four Brahma Viharas. It opens our minds to all beings. You want to have goodwill for all beings, and that means if you see someone who's suffering, you want to have compassion for them. If someone is already happy, you want to have 
empathetic joy. But then you remind yourself that what we experience all depends on our actions. You can't control other people's actions, which is why when we say, may all beings be happy, it's not that we necessarily think that we can make them happy or that they will be happy, but we want to make sure that in terms of our intentions, we're not going to do anything that's going to harm the true happiness of others. In other words, it's going to make them break the precepts. And we have to look after our actions. Other people may tell you to do X, and you have to ask yourself, this is going to be my action when I do it. Should I give in to that pressure? And this relates to the other chant that we do every night, which is the chant about the requisites. Because a lot of the pressure we get in our lives, especially when you're working for a corporation or working for a company, there's the pressure to make more money. So you're going to have more things. And a reflection of the requisites is to remind us, one, that we don't really need that much in terms of food, clothing, shelter, medicine. And we also have to think about the fact that the more we get of these things, the more we're placing a burden on the rest of the world. So even though our culture may really prize having lots of toys, when you think of the karmic consequences of having lots of toys, they get a lot less attractive. And when the toys don't attract you, the culture has a lot less power over you. So again, this is a liberating contemplation. Similarly with the contemplations on what they call the five reflections, or subject to aging, illness, death, and separation. The only thing we have to depend on is our karma. Whatever we do, for good or for evil, to that will we fall heir. That's true for us, it's true for everybody. It's good to think about these things every day, every day. They're simple contemplations, and they're true for everybody. They're true here in America, and they're true in Thailand, they're true in India, they're true everywhere. Regardless of where you are on the social spectrum, and they help you step outside the world of the world of your work, the world of your family. So you can remind yourself of what your values are, and you want your values to be shaped in line with the larger picture. So remind yourself of that larger picture every day. Particularly with the, the Brahma Viharas, it's good to think about all beings before you meditate and when you come out. You do it but before you meditate to remind yourself of the larger picture. Just like the Buddha on the night of his awakening, he, you think we have narratives that we bring into the meditation. He had thousands and thousands of them he could remember. But instead of going straight to the present moment from that knowledge, he went into the knowledge of what's the larger picture here. Because it was only by seeing the larger picture that he realized the principle of karma, that this process of rebirth happens because of our actions, our intentions, which are shaped by our views. And once he saw the pattern, then he could focus in on the present moment. And in focusing on the pattern, it took a lot of the personal sting out of this particular problem or that particular issue, because you could see it in the larger picture. That enables you to step back from it so that you can settle down and meditate properly, realizing that whatever your issues are, the suffering that you feel from them comes from your own craving, comes from your own clinging. And whatever issues are going to come up in the course of the day, you don't know what they are, but you do know you're going to need a lot of mindfulness, you're going to need a lot of alertness. So you want to work ardently on developing those qualities. So that reflection helps get you into the meditation. When you leave the meditation, the reflection of the Brahma Vahars reminds you of what values you want to carry into the world. And then you can think about what do you want to get out of the world. The Buddha talks about seven, seven treasures, which are all treasures of the mind. 
There's conviction, i.e. conviction in the Buddha's awakening, which translates conviction into conviction in the principle of action, that your actions really do matter. Based on that, you have virtue and then a sense of shame and a sense of compunction. Virtue is the desire not to harm. It's making up your mind not to harm. Again, this is why we take this as our value, because there's so many arguments and so many voices saying, well, there are times when you do have to harm, there are times when you have to protect yourself or protect others. And well, what he said, we don't want to harm anybody. We certainly don't want to kill anybody or steal. I mean, this is what the precepts are all about. I mean, you can strike back in self-defense, but you can't do it with the intention of killing. But the precepts set certain boundaries on your behavior. Otherwise, you're not going to scramble to get things and in a way that's going to be really bad for other people and bad for yourself in the long run. Remember the Buddha's vision of the world, a fish fighting over a little bit of water in a puddle that's drying up. And if one of the fishes kills another fish, for what? For one little more gulp of water, and then it dies. What's accomplished by that? And then your virtue is protected by your sense of shame and compunction. Shame here is not the unhealthy kind of shame that psychologists are talking about all the time. It's the healthy sense of shame that comes with a sense of honor. In other words, you realize that certain actions are beneath you, and you would be ashamed to do them. And that protects you from doing them. Compunction is the fear of the consequences that are going to come if you do something really unskillful. That protects you as well. Now, in some cases, it may look like you're going to lose in terms of the world, but you don't have to look good in the eyes of the world. You want to look good in the eyes of the Buddha. You want to look good in the eyes of the Noble Ones. But this is why they call these precepts the precepts that are loved by the Noble Ones, the precepts that are admired by the Noble Ones. You want to keep their perspective in mind. The other treasures are learning, generosity, and discernment. Learning means knowing the Dharma. We fill our heads with so much garbage. It's good to clear some of that garbage out and fill it with Dharma instead. So when difficult situations come up, you've got something you can fall back on. You can remember, oh, the Buddha said this, when he talks about true victory being victory over yourself rather than victory over others. That can prevent you from making all kinds of mistakes and trying to beat somebody else out at work. Not the kind of game playing that goes on in couples. You have to remember, okay, what is a genuine victory? What is a victory in the eyes of the Buddha? You've got that knowledge you can fall back on. Generosity is what opens the heart. Makes you realize that you have a lot that you can share with others, and once you've shared something, that it really becomes yours. As the Buddha said, if you if beings of the world knew the rewards of generosity the way he did, they wouldn't eat without sharing, even if it were their last meal. As long as there was somebody there to share it with, they would share. You don't have to think about the rewards all you know in the previous or <coughs> excuse me rewards in another lifetime. You think of the rewards right now, the quality of heart that goes with. Okay, I can give this to somebody. I don't need to hoard it all for myself, because the hoarder's mind is very narrow. And as a result, what happens, as the Buddha said, is the very thing that hoarders are afraid of, poverty, is what happens from hoarding. And finally, there's discernment. And John Lee has a nice comment about this. He says that if you've got discernment, then all you need is a machete. You can set yourself up in life. In other words, this is what you, teaches you to make the most of what little you've got. And to appreciate what you've got, to make them, to make it something that's really good for the mind. So these are some of the things you want to, the forms of wealth you want to gain through life. Not wealth and material things, but wealth and qualities of the mind. And it's good to remind yourself of these things every day, every day, so they form the context. 
we live in a world where things are very pressing all the time, and the fact that something is pressing often makes us mistake it for something important. But there's a really huge difference. Just because someone's pushing, pushing something on you doesn't mean that it's really important. It means that simply they want it. You want to have a fund of inner wealth, this inner space, inner sense of values, clear values. You can step back from being pressed like that and decide, well, is this something I really want to give into? Or is this some case where I have to draw the line? And it's in being able to draw the line for yourself. That's what gives you freedom. So you don't have to be totally shaped by your culture, or totally shaped by your job or your family. That freedom to draw the line is what comes from having this larger sense of what things are all about. Putting your life into the practice rather than putting the practice into your life. So remember these values. They're simple, they're basic, but they can make all the difference in the world.